Hello, you're listening to the Super Power You podcast. This is episode 120. I'm Lisa betz and my guest today is modern elder Chip Conley. Welcome to the Super Power You podcast, where we reveal the mental models and tactical skills needed to activate your inner superhero. And here's your host, Lisa betz Hello, hello. Thank you for being with me here today. I am always grateful for your attention. I'm grateful for your time. I'm so grateful to have you here with me. (laughs) And before we jump into today's show, I want to say what an incredible pleasure it was to interview my guest for this week, Chip Conley. I have been fangirling him from a distance for quite a while, and he has already been interviewed by some of my favorites, some amazing hosts, and I just loved listening to all of his conversations as part of my research, which I always do before I interview someone who isn't a personal friend. His conversations in the past, which you can certainly find online, represent a treasure of various experiences and perspectives from his life. And I know you are going to enjoy the wisdom and the stories born of his life experience. And I'm also guessing that while Chip Conley is indeed a very unique and special person, I know that there are dear ones in your life who might not be famous. They might not be published authors, but they still have incredible stories to share. And while their experiences are probably quite different from Chip's and from the stories of my other guests, I know that a conversation with them would reveal some pretty special stories and memories. And that's why I created Audio Keepsakes, which are recorded interviews with the special people in your life whose stories matter, whose experiences matter, who have life legacies to share for you, for your children, and for future generations. Audio keepsakes are long-form interviews, like the conversations I have with my special podcast guests, featuring your loved ones in order to preserve their stories in their voices for now and forever. For more information, visit lisabl.com slash life legacies or audiokeepsakes.com. My guest today is a New York Times best selling author and an American hotelier who has disrupted that industry not once, but twice. Chip Conley founded the hotel chain Joie de Vivre at the age of 26. And in 2010, after creating and managing 50 boutique hotels, he sold the company and he went on a journey to explore the power of festivals and of ritual, which inspired him to found Fest 300 and earned him the title of the godfather of festivals. In 2013, he joined Airbnb, where today he serves as the company's strategic advisor for hospitality and leadership. In our conversation today, we also talked about what it means to be a modern elder and the founding of the Modern Elder Academy, being the other, empathetic leadership, the power of language, his role at Airbnb, and intergenerational collaboration. And we also talked about Jessica Simon, who was featured in the Superpower You podcast episode number 89, and who Chip mentored at Airbnb, and who was featured in one of his books. Now, if that is not enough, we talk about going through the stages, not ages, and growing whole, not old, as well as service as a central tenant to powerful leadership and to servant leadership. Chip is such a wonderful thinker that even though we recorded this conversation over a month ago, his perspective on the pandemic situation and how it will unfold is still relevant. And we are still digesting where it's leading. And as this conversation goes live, we are absolutely in the midst of the hospitality industry's most massive depression. And in 
on Twitter this week, Chip gave a shout out and a thank you to the nobility of the hospitality industry of which he has been a part for so much of his life. He notes that it is in its deepest valley ever and notes the irony of the fact that right now we could actually all use a little more hospitality. So by way of thanks, Chip quoted Maya Angelou this week saying, people will forget what you said, they'll forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel as a beautiful ode to that business, but also words of wisdom for all businesses and for all of us right now in these changing times. So I am sure it is obvious that I absolutely loved my conversation with Chip Conley, and I wish I had so much more time with him, since I know we just scratched the surface of his wisdom and his life experience. I will link to his work in the show notes at lisabl.com slash 119. But right now, let's jump in and meet Chip Conley. Welcome to the Superpower You podcast, Chip Conley. Thank you. It's just a joy to be with you, Lisa. I'm absolutely delighted to have you on the show. I like to let my listeners know what my connection is with my guests. And in your case, I have some really beautiful gossamer tendril connections to you through various people over the years. But most recently, I want to thank Keith Powers, who said you have to be talking to Chip Conley, and to Janice Nakano Spivak, who actually made the introduction. Grateful to them. Well, listen, I, I'm, I'm thrilled that we get a chance to converse. Reinvention and personal growth seem to be fairly central to your life. You have reinvented yourself many times, you model it, you support it in other people. And I'm wondering if that is a descriptor that you that you identify with. You know, it's interesting. I have mixed feelings about the word reinvention because it, it sounds so challenging. I often think of myself as having reintention. And so the reintention basically means I take what I've got and instead of having to reinvent myself, I actually take what I have, my mastery, you know, the wisdom I've developed, my experiences, and then I repurpose it or reintend it in new directions. And whereas sometimes I think when people think of reinvention, they feel like, oh my gosh, I'm a 50 year old school teacher who needs to go learn how to become a software engineer because that's the reinvention. It, it sounds like a, such a chasm that you have to jump over that a lot of people wouldn't do it. So I think actually helping people to understand that it's really taking what you've learned, editing what's no longer relevant, and reintending it, repurposing it for things that for many people might look like a reinvention because it's like same, same seed, different soil. Meaning take the seed of who you are and then apply it maybe in a new garden. Beautiful. That's such a, a perfect example of what I've seen and heard you do so many times. Obviously, you love to play with language. and yes, I do. <laughs> and I actually wrote down as I was listening to various things and reading things, I wrote down a couple of the similar wordplay that I've, I've loved of yours. Things like can do it versus conduit. Mm -hmm. And reverence versus relevance mm. and sage on the stage versus guide on the side. And there are more, there's like three or four more I've written down. So obviously that's the kind of wordplay that you're quite masterful at. I'm all about bumper stickers. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I really appreciate hearing from my guests, if you wouldn't mind sharing, is something from your childhood or something from your family of origin mm. that you think might have informed who you are today and and how you're showing up in the world now? I'll be brief, but just a few things. I'm firstborn and the only boy in a family of two parents who were firstborn. So, so we have a lot of type, type A energy in the three of us, and then I have two younger sisters. And I think being the only boy and the firstborn and you know, being on a path where they, they had a very, very specific idea of what my life was supposed to be like, and I did my best to adhere to it for a long time until I didn't. <laughs> and mm. then I, I truly rebelled on, on many levels. So I think, you know, there was an element for me of being very disciplined. My father was a Marine captain in the reserves. So there's a lot of discipline built in me. So even if I'm doing artistic and wacky, wild things, there's usually a discipline, you know, underneath it. Not to say that it means I don't sometimes just completely let loose where I have no idea where something's going. For sure. I do that too. 
I grew up in a predominantly white neighborhood, but I went to junior high school and high school in the inner city. My parents chose to, instead of sending me to a private school, which is what a lot of white parents would do, uh, instead I, I went to a rather famous inner city LA high school that's the number one feeder high school for the NBA and NFL. So I was called Curious White Boy because I was very curious about other cultures. It really helped me to understand what it means to be the other, and I th- which is, I think, a really valuable quality in the 21st century in, in a more diverse world. So to understand what it means to be the other has allowed me to be empathetic toward other people. And frankly, I have been the other. I, you know, in high school, I was the other because being white was, I was a minority in my school. Mm-hmm. And then I came out as a gay man at age 22 when I was in business school. And it was very different, you know, back in 1983 coming it out. It was very different. <laughs> very different than it is today. And, and especially as someone who was like, oh, I'm supposed to be president of the United States someday. That's what my parents wanted for me. Well, uh, I, I don't know too many gay presidents, but I did actually become a CEO at age 26, started my own company and became a CEO as the, a gay CEO, which was also pretty unusual. And then more recently, having spent the last seven years with the founders of Airbnb, helping to steer their rocket ship with them and for four of those seven years being full-time in headquarters, I was twice the age of the average employee uh, mm-hmm. there. So I was the modern elder, so to speak. That's what they called me. Mm-hmm. So whether it's being a white guy in a dark skin school, whether it's being a, a gay man in a fraternity and an all-American athlete, which was unusual, and then a gay CEO, or whether it's being an old guy in a company full of millennials, I have learned what it means to be the other. And that's allowed me to be so much more empathetic as a leader and as a person to other people. Absolutely. I've listened to a lot of different interviews and read a bunch of things and actually haven't heard that particular take on things in terms of your experience. I saved it for you, Lisa. I love it because that's very much a part of my identity. (laughs) (laughs) And one of the things I feel that I bring to my understanding. So I love that 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 (laughs) came out here. Beautiful. There's so many directions I want to go with you. And obviously, we have to get to the Modern Elder Academy and being a modern elder. But before we do, I'm wondering if we can talk a little bit about what is super valuable to me. And I think you are masterful in, and I have already referenced it, and that is the power of language and your ability to communicate with amazing verbal nuance. So I know you've written five books and you've been on lots of bestseller lists, but you know, not all authors are as masterful with spoken language as you are. Mm. Mm. And for myself, I consider myself to be a verbal processor. And, you know, I have to say what a gift of self-understanding that has been for me to realize. Mm. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you actually process information verbally the way I do, but you are certainly masterful with it. And that's one of the qualities that I think is really beautiful. And so I want to talk about how you see language and identity, how we name ourselves, monikers, the idea of being a modern elder. There is so much in the language we use to to identify ourselves, to speak about ourselves. And I know in one of the interviews, I heard you say that that's a, a moniker you're playing with right now. Mm. And so maybe you can share a little bit about the subtleties and the nuance around the idea of elder versus elderly. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. There are a few things that, where it's good to be old. Sometimes a vintage car, that's a good thing. But mo- most things, the cheese, or well, cheese could actually be good as old also, but you know. Cheese is good old. <laughs> yeah, but, but most things in your refrigerator are not good when they're old. So well, first of all, let's just know, okay, I grew up in the inner city. And so you get me started on rap. Not, not that I grew up with rap because rap didn't exist. Right. But I grew up with spoken word. And there's an organization called Youth Speaks. And I used to be on the board of Youth Speaks. It's a famous, the number one spoken word for teens, nonprofit org in the US and maybe the world. And spoken word is basically learning how to piece together language in a way that's poetic and powerful and lyrical and logical at the same time. And so I guess I could be Eminem someday. That's what I want to <laughs> the, you know. So long story short is that is probably influencing how I am as an adult. Also, as a kid, I was very introverted up until about age 13 or 14. So I was just, you know, for me, it was language in writing and in books and then listening to people and 
listening to tapes of people. So that all influenced me. As we go into this era now of, of me being the modern elder at, at Airbnb, what happened was about three months into working there seven years ago, Brian Chesky, the CEO, who I was mentoring, but he was also my boss. <laughs> he was mm-hmm. tw- 21 years younger than me and my boss, and I was also his mentor. So it was an interesting juxtaposition of our relationships. I was the mentor and the intern at the same time. He said to me, Chip, sorry, we hired you for your knowledge, but what we've really gotten is your wisdom. And then Joe Gebbia, his co-founder, said, you are our modern elder, Chip. And I was like, fuck you. <laughs> I don't want to be a modern elder. That's like, that sounds awful. Because in my mind, elder and elderly were the same thing. Right. And, you know, the word elder, you know, hasn't really been used much in the last hundred years. It goes back a long time. In indigenous cultures, it's still quite often used. Unfortunately, it's usually just used for men. And so that's one of the challenges with it. Also, the Mormon church has elders and breaking elder away from the church and uh, away from patrimony. It's a reclamation. It's a reclamation, just like queer was a reclamation, as black was a reclamation. Black was a very derogatory term. Yankee was a derogatory term that the British called the colonists long Mm -hmm. ago. So I'm reclaiming a word. And but getting in a new spin, and this is where modern elder is interesting. The fact that they called me that, I ultimately claimed it and said, "You okay, I am that. So why I liked modern elder as, as a phrase, especially in the workplace, was 40% of us have a boss that's younger than us. Um, if you're 55 years old, there's a 70% chance you have a boss younger than you. So we have, live in an, in an era where there is there are five generations in the workplace for the first time. And there's a lot of intergenerational collaboration possible. And yet, we don't know what to make of these older people. And frankly, a lot of us older people don't know what to make of ourselves in a world where we're going to live longer, but power seems to be moving younger, and the world is changing faster. And so the idea of juxtaposing the word modern with elder was sort of genius on their part to call me that. And then I owned it. And then I did my part in saying, listen, The modern elder is as curious as they are wise. That's the alchemy. The alchemy of what it makes a modern elder is not somebody who just dispenses wisdom. It's someone who's as much of a wisdom seeker as they are a wisdom keeper. And that that element of being the wisdom keeper is what we think of with elder. But the wisdom seeker is the curiosity piece of it. And curiosity Mm -hmm. opens up possibility and wisdom distills down what's important and essential. So having both of those qualities being able to open up possibilities with your curiosity, but also then with being able to focus and help people to see what's truly essential in life, which is really what wisdom's about. That is exceptionally valuable in an era where more and more companies are being run by younger people who are brilliant, specifically focused brilliance in certain areas often around technology Mm -hmm. quite often, but they don't necessarily have the pattern recognition of wisdom and figuring out what's most essential. So, Absolutely. When I heard your description of being an intern who's also a mentor, I think is the way you put it, yeah. I, it made me think of the idea of servant leadership yeah. and how there's, in some ways, there's this duality between how we show up in the world in that we are playing both roles at the same time and there's a deepening and a service to that, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I totally love. So when it comes to language, I've always had a hard time with, with the term servant leadership, even though I totally buy into it. The term it's, I struggle with, it's servant is, um, well, I mean, it's, it's like elder. I mean, so in the sense that people sometimes right. re- recoil from the word elder, just like the recoil from the word servant. But what's nice about servant leadership, once you get past the word servant, it's almost like noblesse oblige, which is a French way of saying, to the nobility is the obligation. And in the context of an organization, that means to the leadership comes the obligation of serving those that you're leading. So the higher you are in an organization, the more your role is to serve. I believe that down to my toes. It's how I've always tried to operate. I think the idea of deference to the senior leadership or you know, getting your own parking place in front of the building because you're the CEO or you know, X, Y, or Z, there's a bunch of privilege that's built into power. Let's just start with that. Mm-hmm. So because you have that privilege and because you have that power, 
you have the ability to share all kinds of other things. And, and most importantly, the question I like to ask, which is very much of a servant leadership question with anybody who's a direct report of mine in any business I've been involved with has been, how can I support you to do the best work of your life here at Airbnb, Modern mm-hmm. Elder Academy, or mm-hmm. Joie de Vivre, um, the three companies that I've been most involved in? I mean, I've always heard servant leadership in exactly that way, and you just articulated it beautifully. But to me, that is the gorgeousness and the power of the idea of servant leadership is that it's through the act of serving the highest good of another that you're leading. Yes, exactly. And I think that that question is a beautiful opening question. So interestingly, one of our other connections is about five years ago, my friend Jessica Simon, who you know, who was probably one of those people that you were posing that question to. Mm Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, I took part in her Passion Co. project, mm. and it was through her work and through my participation in it that I did the first incarnation of what's now a talk that I call Rebranding Aging. At the time, was called Change Agents. So I love that there's these circles of influence and impact, and you know, I know that you had such a big impact on Jessica when she worked with you there. I loved working with her, and I write about it in my book, Wisdom at Work, The Making of a Modern Elder. She's at the start of chapter seven, and she was really just about to leave the company when I, I, I'd gotten to know her from the very start, uh, but she was reporting to someone else in a different department, and she had a lot of untapped potential, and so she was going to leave the company, you know, feeling dejected, and I just said, listen, I, I have a project I could use your help on. It just landed in my lap, and I need somebody to work full-time on it, and we'll work together. And it was a great example of is, frankly, when you see someone who's talented, especially in the workplace, and they have a boss that just doesn't know how to provide the kind of light, water, air, and sunlight to allow that person to flourish, it's really a sad case. That describes most people in the workplace. And in this case, Jessica went from being someone who is at risk of leaving the company or being asked to leave the company even to basically being the hero in the company for the company's first Airbnb Open, which is our big host event for global hosts. And it's just a beautiful example of a theory that's called environmental mastery. As we get older, we actually understand the habitats in which we're going to flourish better than when we were younger. And the younger you try to adapt and you, have, you don't have the pattern recognition of like what works for you as well. But as you get further along in life, you, you get a better sense of how to repot yourself in new Absolutely. ways. And that's a really big value, especially in a world where change is sort of essential and pretty much built into the world we live in. You're going to have to repot yourself a lot. Environmental mastery is a quality that is associated with aging because it's like emotional intelligence, something you get better at as you age. Part of my role in in life today is to help people understand that age is not about decrepitude. Yes, your body will start to falter as you get older, but there's all kinds of other qualities and skills you actually start to build that you're better at at age 50 than you are at age 30. And this is the, the, you know, a really interesting opportunity f- from my perspective, because the world we've lived in has had a societal narrative that age is a bad thing and getting old is a bad thing, but even ages, I mean, like, I like to think of ages like stages, <laughs> you know, it's like I'm moving up, you know, in my stages in life, as opposed to, you know, getting old. Also, we say, we say at the Modern Elder Academy, It's not just about growing old, it's about growing whole. And there's, again, research, social science research that really backed us up that says one of the things we get better at as we get older is to integrate ourselves, Mm -hmm. integrate the parts of ourselves. This is what the word integrity comes from. And so, frankly, if you look at people who are teaching ethics and integrity and they're like the best in the world at it, often they're in their 50s, 60s, and 70s because they've learned how to integrate better. Younger in life, we tend to be compartmentalized. And frankly, when we're doing so many things like early midlife, 30s and 40s, having kids, having lots of responsibilities, lots of community responsibilities, sometimes having multiple jobs, we're not integrated. We're frankly disparate. This is actually part of the reason why the studies of the U-curve of happiness have shown that the bottoming out of happiness or contentment in adulthood is between age 45 and 50. 
in most places. You know, your, your mileage may vary, but, but the truth is that's the most treacherous period. And it's when people sometimes hit the reset button and they say, you know what, I, I, I got to do it a different way. And that's frankly why I created the Modern Elder Academy is because there's not a place where you can go do that. It's dedicated and has a curriculum specifically about how to press that reset button. Well, you're speaking about that reminds me of the distinction I've heard you make between the the focus on attainment in youth versus attunement. Mm. Mm. You did like, get my language, didn't you? I love I it. I did. I loved yeah. it. As so many things. I'm like, wow, yes. But let's talk about the Modern Elder Academy and how it came to came to be and how it serves and what it does and what people go there for. Yeah. Being at Airbnb for four years full time, what was very clear to me, especially <laughs> with some of the older employees in the company is that, wow, power has moved younger. And there are people in the company as a tech company who are trying to pretend they were 10 years younger than they were, putting Botox in their face, coloring their hair, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that was partly because there was a sense like, wow, I get more and more irrelevant or obsolescent as I get older. So as I was writing the book, Wisdom at Work, The Making of a Modern Elder, I was interviewing 150 people in midlife. And what I heard over and over again was this sense of irrelevance and bewilderment and anxiety. And what I heard from a few people was like, I have no idea where to go deal with this. I, I, you know, I've got a coach or I've got a therapist or <clears throat> I even have a support group of people in, in the company who are slightly older. But, but I feel like there's not really a focus on how do people repurpose themselves in midlife. And uh, interestingly for me, being a hospitality leader, so I know how to actually create you know, a physical space that feels hospitable and, and, you know, upscale luxury kind of experience. Secondly, you know, I've been on the board of the Esalen Institute, the first personal growth retreat center. Oh, the best my favorite Maryland. places in the world. <laughs> yeah. So I've been there, you know, for 10 years I was on, on the board and been teaching there for 12 years, 13 years, and been going there for 35 years. And so I know, I, like I had no personal growth. And then thirdly, I have this new intellectual property around what does it mean to be a modern elder? And so I was like, okay, hospitality, personal growth retreat center, curriculum around modern elder, let's create the world's first midlife wisdom school dedicated to helping people to repurpose themselves and reimagine how to mine the mastery and shift their mindset on aging. And so we opened in early 2008 with 13 cohorts uh, during our beta period. And then we opened to the public in the fall of 2018 and basically, you know, have been open for... A year and a half because of the the pandemic, we had to close the second half of our second season and we will reopen in the fall. Uh, our academic season goes from October to July. We have four and a half acres on the beach in Baja California Sur, southern Baja Peninsula, about an hour north of Cabo San Lucas. I know people will want to know more, so I'll definitely put a link in the show notes so they can learn more and see what the schedule is and figure out how to sign up if they want to attend. Perfect. Yeah, just sounds just beautiful and absolutely innovative and totally needed. I'm glad you also raised the current pandemic and the situation that we're culturally in right now. And the context I'd put on it is, especially because we're talking about Modern Elder Academy, is that in your interview with Jonathan Fields, I think you said it was a day after your cancer diagnosis and right Mm. before you launched Modern Elder Academy to the public. And in that interview, you said something like, the process of digesting life requires enough space to let it metabolize. Mm. And I'm wondering how the digestion process is going for the current reality (laughs) of the pandemic vis-a-vis hospitality and travel and bringing people together in real life instead of yeah. online. Yeah. Well, it's tough. I mean, let's just start by saying, first of all, in terms of my cancer, a year and a half into it, it's not in remission, but it's actually stopped. So it's intermediate stage prostate cancer. And frankly, the academy has been a really great place for me to metabolize what it means to have cancer inside of me. And the experience has been spectacular until it wasn't, meaning until the pandemic forced us to shut after we'd done 50 cohorts um, and 800 people from 24 countries. So uh, yes, I travel is terrible right now. I mean, I'm on, you know, I'm a a long-time Airbnb person. (laughs) The value of the company has plummeted. Mm -hmm. While I sold Joao Viva, the management company, still own the real estate of a bunch of hotels. You know, eight of the 12 are shut right now. Will this come back? Yes, it will. But is it a fundamentally new time? Like, you know, it is. there's a fundamentally new time when, you know, the Model T Ford was created and all of a mm-hmm. sudden people weren't on horses anymore. So it's going to be a different time. And 
I think it, it doesn't mean that there, people won't be in real life with people anymore, but it, there's going to be a new protocol for, yes. for a lot of things. And I'm still a huge believer of in real life. Um, yeah. it's, it's part of the reason I created the Fest 300 website, which was focused on the world's best festivals. I do believe that you know, in a time where digital reigns, the more digital we get, the more ritual we need. And ritual in the form of online ritual just doesn't have much of a form today. I don't think we'll ever be as close or as transformative as it can be in real life. Because when we're in real life, our mirror neurons in our brain get to dance with each other. Mm -hmm. So long story short is it's a hard time. I'm doing my best to be supportive to a variety of people who are really struggling through it because I've, I've gone through some serious downturns in the past, but nothing like this. So I'm hoping that it, it is opening up a new era in terms of how the world sees so many things. Yeah. And we'll see about that. I mean, it's, it's going to up the ante of status quo versus a whole new way of operating in the world. And I think that, I think it's going to probably, I mean, World War III right now is the virus, but actually I think World War III may be not countries against countries. It's going to be viewpoints against viewpoints in terms of what this experience and, you know, the climate change, et cetera, yeah. what needs to be done that is fundamentally different than how we've been operating. I'm sort of glad I'm in Baja because I'm in a remote farming and fishing community on the beach where I can be a part of nature every single day and I don't hear the shrill and crazy divisiveness as much. Yeah. You know, we'll, it's we'll certainly going to be a painful reconstruction, but hopefully powerful and positive too. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. I'm, I hope you're doing a part in helping to create the conversation. It's some important conversations that need to happen, and it's an unprecedented time bringing up, well, the way I see it is it's bringing, revealing all the shadow that was there in, in the inner world and in our external worlds too. Yeah, <laughs> what we do with sure. it will be the interesting part. I would love to circle back to the idea of joy, because I know joy has been central in your life. Your hotel chain was named after joy. You see joy as distinct from happiness in a beautiful way. And I've been really touched by your idea of the fact that awareness and awareness that emotions are contagious and this idea of collective effervescence. So I just was wondering if you could, you know, if we could sort of end on more of that note and mm -hmm. where collective effervescence shows up, I'm imagining that's central to the idea of bringing modern elders together in mm -hmm. Baja and in certainly to your exploration of the festival circuit and how we gather together and experience collective joy and flow. Well, it's interesting. So the, the, the term collective effervescence, I didn't create it, came from a French sociologist named Emile Durkheim. And 110 years ago, he was studying uh, religious pilgrimages. And what he was able to show was that when you bring together a collection of people who are on purpose together, there's something about their gathering that has purpose built into it. What happens is a, sort of a miracle happens, whereas people's sense of separation, ego separation, starts to evaporate. And what go, comes in its place is this communal joy. And that communal joy, which he coined collective effervescence, is why people go to Burning Man. It's why people go to a musical concert. It's why people go to a political convention or a march. It's why people still show up for live theater or even go into a movie theater as opposed to just seeing everything on Netflix. So uh, the collective effervescence speaks to this idea that our emotions are contagious. It's harder to have them be contagious in the URL world of being digitally. And so I, I think that until we become robots, when frankly maybe we could become communal joy through digital, as humans, that sense of connecting with each other in person, being able to look into someone's eyes and see their soul, you can't do that. I mean, frankly, when I'm on Zoom with you or on any kind of thing with you, if I'm looking at your eyes, I'm actually looking at, then I have to be looking at the camera. Yeah. And the camera's not your eyes. And, and so, you know, maybe this is going to get fixed over time and maybe virtual reality will get us there. But I'm, I'm a bit old school on that level. I think yeah, maybe we have both and we find ways yeah. to improve virtual reality online and we find our path back to in-person collective effervescence experiences. That's right. That's right. And so I think the good news is that they're both important. One of them is exceptionally challenged right now. 
and it's been in the challenge mode for a while, which is the in real life experience. And so, but we'll see. Maybe I'll finish with Walt Disney. He, you know, Walt Disney, it's a small world. Well, it, you know, he, that'll happen. It's a small world. It's like a 60 year old concept. And it's truly a smaller world today in the sense that I can get around the world so much easier today than I could have 60 years ago when I was born. And I think the idea that people want to see the world. And to my mind, this is sort of like the same thing as, you know, why do people go to baseball games when they can watch it on TV? Why do people want to go to the TED conference when they can actually watch TED X? Well, there's certain things that bring you awe and bring you a sense of collective effervescence. Being able to see the Grand Canyon will always be better in person than it can be in virtual reality or whatever other form we, we give it. Yes, you can see more of the world from your home. Absolutely. But mm -hmm. not in the same way. And when you do see it and get introduced to it, I think one of the things that's interesting about global travel today is when you are able to explore things online, see them in videos. In some cases, you don't say, okay, bucket list, I've, I've done that now. No, actually, you're more inclined to say, I want to go experience that. Mm. I think Burning Man's a great example of that. Yeah. People want to go to Burning Man because like, yeah, there's some spectacular vi videos out of Burning Man that take away all of the crap that you have to deal with at Burning Man. Uh, <laughs> then you sort of say, no, I got to go do that. Yeah. And I think that's not going away. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. I look forward to that. So superpower. My concept of a superpower is it's that skill set, that strength that's been with you your entire life, regardless of the age or the stage, regardless of what you've been doing that's so natural to you. It's like the air you breathe or the water you swim in. But to other people, it looks like, wow, how did he do that? And I'm wondering if anything comes to mind for you. I've been called a social alchemist. And I, I will own that phrase, which basically means that part of my talent, maybe in the world or gift that was given to me somehow is to understand how to mix people together in a potent way, whether it's in huge groups, like 20,000 people at our third Airbnb open that was meant to be a transformative festival, or whether it's 18 people here for a week-long Modern Elder Academy program. So yeah, I'm a social Beautiful. alchemist. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. I appreciate your wisdom. I appreciate all that you're doing in the world and for our common view and our common, our common commitment to changing the way that people experience their second half of life. And so I thank you so much for it all. Thank you, Lisa. And there's our show for today. I'm so grateful you were here with me today to hear my conversation with the amazing Chip Conley. Thank you for being here. If you have a chance to give the show a rating or review on Apple Podcasts or your podcast platform, that is super useful for us in helping us to reach more listeners, which allows us to get the message out to more people. So that's always gratefully received. And regardless, I thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your time. I send so much love, so much optimism, and the hope for all of us that as things unfold, as we start to address this new strange world as the new normal, that we find ways to upgrade our lives, to upgrade our individual lives, to upgrade our collective experience in our communities. Once again, show notes can be found at lisabl.com slash 119. You can get more information about Audio Keepsakes at audiokeepsakes.com or lisabl.com slash life legacies. Oh, until next week, I hope you are able to find deep compassion for yourself and for those around you, as well as those who are not in your inner circle as we navigate these crazy times, these unprecedented times where everyone is feeling stress and it's impossible to know exactly the experience of the other. Until next week, I send you big love. Thank you for listening to the Super Power You podcast. Please subscribe to the show on iTunes and get more information at lisabl.com.